Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is in the Old Testament now. And matter of fact, the book of Isaiah has been said to be the Bible within itself. It contains 66 books, just like or 66 chapters. Just like the see, and each of those chapters are interesting are divided up into each of the 66 books of the Bible. Each chapter represents a book of the Bible. And so if we, that was all we ever had, we would have the Bible, just with the book of Isaiah alone. So we thank God for this wonderful, powerful Old Testament book written by the prophet Isaiah. And we thank the Lord, and Isaiah was one that got to see the Lord high and lifted up in his, in his temple, in the train, and, and, his, and so we praise the Lord for that. And uh, Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ came, the first time, his first advent. And the Jewish people were looking forward to the Messiah coming. It had been prophesied by many of the Old Testament prophets of the coming of Christ. And uh, so they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the coming of the Lord. They were looking for their answer to their prayer. They were looking for the promise that God had given to them that the Messiah would come. They were looking for their deliverer that they were looking for that would come. And so uh, they were looking for all of this. And so it was about 300 years before the Old Testament closed. And then there was 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then right at the beginning of the New Testament opens up with the fulfillment of this prophecy of the coming of the Lord. Of all that the Old Testament prophets talked about and prophesied about, God kept His promise. God fulfilled His promise. God uh, uh, fulfilled the fact that He sent a deliverer. He sent a Messiah. He sent a Savior. He answered their prayers, and yet they missed the whole thing. The Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But thank God the next verse says, But as many as who has received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we're going to look at tonight, beginning part one, a little four-part series here, called Simply Sent, the coming of the Lord, that he was the sent one. And we're going to learn some things about that tonight. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the beautiful sunset that's coming and the beautiful evening that you've given to us. Thank you for the wonderful group here tonight and what a good night uh, for a good crowd to come out on Sunday night uh, to study your word and we praise you for that and we thank you for it. And Lord, we do want to lift you up tonight and praise you and once again we'll ask for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. We ask that he would give us illumination, understanding of the scriptures. And Lord, then give us wisdom. Uh, to apply those scriptures that we learned tonight. And there's a great lesson in this learning here as we look for the coming of the Lord and how we can apply it to us today from this Old Testament passage. And Lord, we're going to give you praise now and we're going to give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We'll be looking at the entire chapter of 64, which is only 12 verses. We'll not look at all the verses, but we're going to look at some of them. But our text verse is found in verse number 4. But let's read verses 1 through 4. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, and thou wouldest come down, and that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Isaiah is talking about the Lord coming. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. Here's our text verse tonight. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath I seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. I want to talk to you about waiting. Isaiah talks about things that are prepared for us, that those that wait for the coming of the Lord. We want to talk about the coming of the Lord, church, is all about waiting. It's all about waiting. The Old Testament was waiting over 700 years. They were waiting for the coming of the Lord. How long has the church been waiting? Over 2,000 years. We got them beat. Amen? And we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. 
Now, his first coming came, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But right now, I want us to learn something tonight uh, as we wait for the coming of the Lord. Just like with the nation of Israel, they were waiting, and they were waiting for an answer. Israel was waiting for an answer to their prayers and to the prophecies of the prophets of the coming of the Lord. Even Peter says, you know, and then Peter says, in the last days the scoffers are going to come and say, oh, where is this time of his coming? We've been hearing about that and waiting that for so long. Well, guess what? That doesn't mean he's still not coming. So just hang in there. He's coming. And he's going to come in an hour that you think not. The Son of Man cometh as a thief in the night, and he cometh in an hour as you think not. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. God's going to come in his timing, just like he did here. But we need to learn that how many of you are looking for an answer from the Lord? Guess what? You're going to have to do some waiting. Have you got that answer yet? Now, some you have. But there may be some you've been asking God for, and some time has gone by. And you may have even said something like this, Lord, what in the world are you waiting for? See, we can learn something when it comes to waiting for the Lord. See, and they were waiting for an answer, and you may be tonight waiting for an answer. There may be some things on your heart tonight that you've been asking God for, asking God about, and you know what? You're just going to have to wait. You have to learn to wait. It's that simple. God answers and moves in His time according to his plan. And he knows, and guess what? He's never late. He's always on time. His time, not our time. We have to learn to wait. Wait on the Lord. Got a lot of verses on that we could go through on that. We could be here all night. But I want you to just get a hold of something you can grasp a hold of and retain and try to remember it. That we got to have some waiting for the coming of the Lord. He's coming. But guess what else what Israel was waiting for? They were waiting for relief. Anybody here need some relief tonight? You're going through some difficult times? You're going through some stress? Some stressful times? Circumstances? Situations? You know, the pressure's building? Huh? And you're just thinking, oh, if I could only get some relief. Israel was waiting for relief from their enemies. They were waiting for a deliverer. We can go all the way back even much further. Uh, Israel was waiting uh, for a deliverer. How long in Egypt? 400 years. They were praying, and they had to wait. And God sent them a deliverer by the name of Moses, who was a type of Christ. And so, sometimes, folks, we need relief, and relief is not always spelled with Rolades, <laughs> or Tums, or Mylanta, cherry-flavored, please, pink Pepto-Bismol, the number one bottle of relief. Do you notice sometimes how you take all that stuff and you still don't get relief? Now, God knows what you're going through. And He knows what every one of us is facing, what every trial, whatever testing we're going through. And, there's gonna, and, and you know, we're sitting here, like, oh, God, if you would just come, I would get out of this. Lord, if the rapture would just place right now, we wouldn't have to go through this, and we would have, we would finally be relieved. But sometimes we got to wait. That's the hard part, isn't it? We have to wait. We have to wait on the Lord. I'll be sharing your verse with you in a minute on that as we move along in this. You know what Israel was waiting for also? For forgiveness of their sins. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the, the perfect lamb uh, that would provide the final sacrifice for forgiveness of sin. And you know, sometimes we got brothers and sisters can't forgive themselves. And sometimes I think they, they, they're, they're, they're waiting for God to forgive them when all they got to do is ask. 
What are you waiting for? The lost are waiting for forgiveness. But we got to tell them. We got to show them the way. We got to share the gospel. We got to give them that opportunity. And then all this time in their life, they've been waiting for forgiveness. They've been waiting to be lifted, that burden and that guilt. And sometimes some of you have been carrying it a long time. And the great thing about it is, you see, we don't have to wait for him to come to get forgiveness. He's already come. The forgiveness is right there for you. Right now. What are you waiting for? Why is it that sometimes believers just continue to live in sin, to walk in darkness, when they have forgiveness right there? And it's like by their way they're living, it's like that they're waiting for God to forgive them. When first of all, He already has. He's just wanting you to acknowledge it. He's wanting you to get back in fellowship with Him. But sometimes there's a waiting period. You know what else Israel was waiting for? They were waiting for the promise. Have you you claimed some of God's promises in His book and you're waiting for that promise to be fulfilled? I've heard scholars say there's some 3,000 promises in the Word of God. But I've heard some say that there's actually literally 700. And the reason why 3,000, because out of those 700, some of those have been mentioned many times over. The same promise. And I like the 700 because that's the number of completion. It's the perfection. It's the number of completion. Hey, if God just gave us one, that's good enough. But to give us 700, and some of those we're still waiting on. Did Jesus promise he would come again? We're waiting, aren't we? They were in the upper room for 10 days in a prayer meeting. What were they waiting for? The coming of the Holy Spirit. You go there and wait and be to you and be endued with power from on high. They had to wait 10 days to get the Holy Ghost. I'm glad today when we get saved, we don't have to wait to get it. But some of you are waiting to get the power because you haven't asked for it. See, and there's so many promises in your sin. Say, God, I read this in your book, and I claim this promise for me. Where is it? Is God going to fail in his promise? Is God not going to not keep his promise? No, but sometimes you've got to wait for it. And I'm going to show you why there's this waiting is so important. If you'll hang in here with me. So we have to wait for the promise. In Isaiah 64, 1, look back up at your Bible, the first verse. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. God has promises for us. But you see, the nation of Israel had to wait for God to come down. As a matter of fact, when Isaiah wrote this, They had to wait 700 years. Most of them died off. Probably all that generation died off. And only did they carry it down through generation to generation so that by the time we got over to the New Testament, especially after, can you imagine going 400 years and not hear from God? Can you imagine God being silent for 400 years of silence? And they're saying, where is the promise? Isn't that what they said in Peter? Where is the promise of his coming? We've heard this since forefathers. And it hasn't happened yet. See, they didn't bother putting that in there. See, God's going to keep his promise. Whatever promise you've claimed that you're looking for, then God will fulfill it. But it's going to be in his time, his place, Everything. Jesus is coming. God promised that. But it, it's coming. you got to wait. You're promised heaven, but you got to wait for it. Amen. And so while you're waiting, just trust and believe God. So you see, there, there, there's a waiting period for the coming of the Lord and some of the things that go along with it. 
you see. How many of you want to be relieved from this old world? Well, I mean, we're, we're many. How many of you want to be relieved from this old body? Huh? Well, wait a minute. You know what a promise God gave me? He said, boy, you're going to get a new body, but you got to wait. Oh, come on, God. No, you got to wait. Well, I've been waiting 40 years. Oh, bless your heart. That's about one second or one-tenth of a hundredth of a second in God's timetable. But has God promised you a new body? But you got to wait. Has God promised you the Lord's coming? you got to wait. Has God promised you a home in heaven? you got to wait. you got to wait. So let's learn. But now, what's all this purpose of waiting? I'm glad you asked. Waiting is a time of spiritual growth. While we're waiting for the coming of the Lord, God wants you and I to grow. He wants us to grow spiritually. We're to be growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. We're to be abounding in so many things. And the word abounding means to be growing. We're to be growing in this grace and in that grace and growing in this and see that you grow and, and so forth. And so that's what we're to be doing while we're waiting for the promise and the relief of the coming of the Lord. And we're praying for his coming, and God is going to answer it. In the meantime, start growing. Don't be satisfied where you are today. Don't become complacent and content with the way things are. We're to be moving forward. Don't become stagnant. Don't become pl- complacent. The church isn't supposed to sit like a wooden Indian in front of a cigar store. We're supposed to be on the move. We are a mighty army on the move for God. We're to be going forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message I was going to preach this morning was about a vision of grace that God had given to me. And I wanted to share that vision with you for this church. And for some reason, God said, preach this other thing. I go, I don't want to. I said, that doesn't put a lot of smile on people's faces. They're not going to be, everybody's going to be happy. He goes, I don't care. You do what I tell you, boy. Because somebody needs to hear it. And if everybody in the church is good and we're all walking in the light, praise God. But what about the seven billion people that are not? You see, you ought to understand sometimes, like this morning, it's not always for us. It's for the 8 million people in Central Florida, the homes we go in. It's for the half a million people we go into the two counties. It's for the 7.2 billion people around the world on Internet and YouTube, you see, that goes around the globe. So don't get upset and get mad and think it's always the preachers getting all over me. Because if you feel that way, it's not me, it's God getting all over you. So don't get mad at me and blame me. Your argument's with him and, and, and just might as well throw up the white, fl- white flag and surrender because you're not going to win. So why bother bothering and bucking it because you're just not going to win. You're not going to beat God. And, and, and I have said sometimes this way, you're not going to beat God at his own game because he made the rules and you got to play by them. And if you don't like it, you know what he says? Tough. He said, I'm not changing it just for you. See, none of us have this little special dispensation. Well, that's my little preacher boy down there, Georgie boy, so it's okay. He can get by with it. He can, that's okay. No. No. So it's a time of spiritual growth. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalms here. Follow along your notes. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I. Talk to me, church. Are you hoping in his word? My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say than they that watch for the morning. Now turn back to Isaiah chapter 41. And write this down in your notes there. Waiting is a time of spiritual growth. You've got Psalms, but next to Psalms, put parentheses there, or a forward slash or something, and put Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 31. Let's look at it. You all know this by heart. But they that wait, and who are we waiting? 
upon. The Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Those are three stages of growth, by the way. Isaiah covered all three. Did you know that? He covered the young Christian. He covered the adult Christian. He covered the mature Christian. You see that? Because why? We're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And in that waiting, we need to be growing spiritually. And we start out as young believers. We start out young in our Christian growth. That's for the, the young shall mount up with wings as eagles. That's the young. Okay? The adult Christian shall run and not grow weary. The mature Christian shall walk. See, when we get older, we slow down. The young one's going to fly and soar like an eagle. The middle-aged adult, he's going to run. And the older dudes, we're going to walk. See, three stages of growth. You see, the young, he turns into an adult, and then he turns into maturity. Three stages of spiritual growth. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. They, they that wait upon the Lord. You, you know the song, amen? Have you all sung this song before? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. That's where that song came from. Right there out of that verse. So you see, spiritual growth or waiting time is a time for you and I to grow. Now, if we've been saved 30, 40, 50 years, we ought to be in the third stage. We ought to be mature in our spiritual growth. We're not to be young. We're not to be even adults. We need to be in the mature stage. And some of us, we've had a long time waiting for the Lord. And guess what? We may have a little longer time waiting for the Lord. So it's time to move from eagles and running to being an adult and, and just running. You can't soar and fly with the young eaglets anymore. Amen? But you can maybe got a little two-step and a little bit of running. But looking at, well, well Sean, he's a, Sean's an eagle. Okay? Sean's an eagle. He's young in the Lord. He's going to soar with the eagles. But eventually he needs to turn into adulthood in his spiritual life. And he doesn't have to be 30 or 40 to be an adult in his spiritual life. He stays in here and with his church and stays under the sound and the preaching and teaching of God's word four times a week. I'll tell you what, he'll go from being an eagle to an adult real quick. And he'll develop into spiritual adulthood. And then by the time he's in his maybe late 20s or 30s, he ought to be a mature believer in Christ. He doesn't have to be 90 to be walking around like we're half dead. You see, it's spiritually. He's smiling and grinning over there. Oh, he loves it. He loves attention. Amen. So, since waiting is a time of spiritual growth, what's the first thing we want to do here? Waiting is a time to develop trust. Waiting is a time to develop trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. With all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Turn over to Psalms with me, back a little bit, and go to Psalms 37. Psalms 37, one of my favorite psalms in the scripture. We're talking about that waiting is a time to develop trust. Everybody in Psalms 37? All right, look at verse 3. Everybody with me? Psalms 37, verse 3. What's it say? Trust where? In the Lord. Look at verse 4. Delight thyself who? Where? In the Lord. Look at verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust in Him. Look at verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. You see. And we could go on and on. So in this waiting period, God wants you and I to grow spiritually. And we ought to be stronger in our spiritual growth, and more advanced in it than we were last year and the year before. We're not to stay babies in the faith. 
Peter says we're, when we're young, we're babies, and we desire the sincere milk of the word that we may what? Grow thereby. Paul gets over to the church of Corinth, and he says, you bunch of babies? He says, I can't feed you meat because you're, you're a bunch of babies. You don't want to grow up. And he said, you're carnal. And when he finally finished both letters, he said, and you are still carnal. They weren't growing. And you're going to grow by being in the Word. You're going to grow in it by getting in into yourself and getting into it. You'll grow by getting here in Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. That's how you're going to grow in the Word. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word. And everybody's going to say, oh, I wish I had as much faith as you. You can have more faith than I do. You can ask God to increase your faith. And he goes, okay, not a problem. Get in the book. You want to increase faith? Get in the book. Now, just think about it. If God says you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, Be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be done. I don't see too many of us casting mountains. So that means our faith is smaller than a mustard seed. We got a ways to grow, don't we? Come on now. All right? I mean, we want to see big things done and accomplished for God, and we want to see God move mountains, and we want to see God heal people, and we want to see uh, people saved, and we want to see our own television program seven days a week on the program on television. That's my vision and dream for this church, to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. Uh, that's my grace and vision, you see. But it's going to take everything to do it. It's going to take faith in God to do it and to trust God to do it. And He can. You say, with this little church, little group of vagabonds, absolutely, amen. If God is in it, then who can be against us? God doesn't look for numbers. God can do miracles. Hey, God changed the world with 12 men. You just, we just got to be committed men. You say, well, they got to do all these miracles and mites and everything. Well, yes, they did that. And that was for a dispensation of time to, be, to be authenticate the Word of God and to uh, substantiate the Word and to, and to bring confirmation to the Word because they did not have the written Word. And God used that to bring confirmation to His Word. That's when God backed them up with His Word. And now he says, hey, we don't really need all that today. Now we need to trust in the Lord, believe the Lord, have faith in the Lord, because we got the whole Word of God. And he says, this is all you need. What more do you want? Well, I want faith to move mountains. No cake. It's in here. You just got to exercise it and, and, and put it to work. You got to exercise. You got to get out of the boat. So it's a time to trust the Lord. Amen. Oh, praise God. It's waiting. The time is the time to develop patience. Oh, we, could, we got that word in Sunday school a few weeks ago. Patience. Add to your faith. Patience. I don't want it. Well, then you're not going to grow. And then one, this is one we, this is the hardest one we work on, isn't it? And some of it has taken 40, 60, 70 years, and we're still working on it. Well, maybe that's why the Lord hadn't come yet, because we're still waiting for Him to come, and He's waiting for you to get patience. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something, huh? Oh, my. Let's read it real quickly. Be patient, therefore. We're reading out of James, the book of James, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren. Now, what are we talking about? Until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it. Until he receiveth the early and latter rain, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now that is a promise from God, but you've got to wait. And in, in, in the process of waiting, you're going to have to have some patience. Woo. Waiting is a time to develop love. Oh, we've been hearing such good reports and calls coming in and Facebook and even from our own folks of the month of February that we did on My Love, My Church. I never knew that God was going to have such an impact with that. And I had some already said, can we do something like that, similar to that in the future? I said, well, I'm working on something. 
and we'll see what God has for us. But wow, praise God. It's a time to develop love. Charity suffereth long, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. Paul's love letter to the church of Corinth. But by the way, matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is all about spiritual gifts. So is chapter 12 before it, and so is chapter 14 after it. All three of those chapters are about spiritual gifts. Did you know love's a spiritual gift? You can't love without the Spirit of God giving you that gift. Oh, praise God. So we're in the waiting period, church. And what are we waiting for? The coming of the Lord. And while we're waiting, we're going to have to learn to trust God. Things may, look, things may get dim and, and grow dark and look dark. Are we going to keep trusting God or are we going to throw the towel in? Huh? Okay, come on now. We're going to have to have patience. Well, Lord, I want you to come right now. Well, how many like that? How many would you like that? Come on, everybody agree with me here tonight, all right? Would everybody like the Lord to come right now? I mean, are you all ready? See, see, if you don't want the Lord to come right now, you're not ready. If you don't want the Lord to come right now, you're not ready. And I suggest you get ready. Because He could come right now, regardless of what I'm doing here right now. I've got nothing to do with it, but if He wanted to come right now, He'd come and you'd better be ready. Or you're going to miss the trip. Get ready. And then be patient. Get ready. Trust God. Get ready. Start loving people. Waiting's a time to develop character. Develop character in our lives. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. That's character. And he shall strengthen thine heart. That's character. Wait, I say, on the Lord. All right? So there's our waiting time. Jesus was sent. The promise was fulfilled. The prayers were answered. Okay? The deliverer had come. And Jesus was sent. Amen? Jesus was sent. And Jesus was sent to show the power of God. He was sent to show the power of God. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither have I the eye seen. O God, beside thee, what hath he prepared for him that waiteth for him? And when Jesus came, Jesus demonstrated God's power. God answered. He was sent to show God's power. Jesus was sent to rescue us from sin. Look at verse 5 now. You got it there, but in your Bible, now we're going to look at a few of the verses. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, for we have sinned in those in countenance, and we shall be saved. Jesus was sent to save us from our sins. He was sent to redeem us from our sin. Look at Isaiah 64, 5 says, but and here, I get this one. Jesus was sent to rescue you from your good works. Yeah. Romans 3, 10, there is none good, no, not one. For by grace are you saved through faith. This is a gift of God, not of works, so any man, not of what? Not of works. Aren't you glad God came to save us from all of our wonderful good works? Look at verse 6 in that verse, same chapter, 64. But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness, all of our good works, hello church, are as filthy rags. What did we talk about this morning? A little bit. And we do all fade as the leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. God sent Jesus in the fullness of time to redeem us from our sin and to save us from our good works. Because you're not going to get to heaven with good works. You're not going to get there with good deeds or any other thing. So that's why we needed a Savior. That's why God needed to send Jesus. That's why God promised that He would, but you're going to have to wait 700 years before He gets there. And now we're waiting 2,000 years for him to come again. 
And in that 2,000 years we're waiting, guess what? God is saving people every day. Ha! One got saved yesterday. You see. Are you with me? And no telling how many got saved today. I mean, we got preachers around the world preaching the gospel this morning. And I'm, I'm not convinced that thousands were saved today. You see, why? Because the power of God was being demonstrated through the person of Christ and the message of the cross, and people were getting saved because God sent a Redeemer to save us. Wow. Man, I'm so glad God saved me from my stinking good works. Jesus was sent to to show us that we might rely on Him for our salvation. You're not going to get any other salvation apart from Christ. He's the only person you can rely on for salvation because he's the only one that can give it to you. And by the way, salvation speaks of deliverance as well. So let's just say we're saved. Any times ever come up in your life you need to be delivered? Has there been a time that the bad guy's on your back? Huh? And God, you cry out, Lord, I need some deliverance. You ever been under oppression? And have the evil one oppress you as a believer? And say, God, I need some relief. I need somebody to relieve me of the oppression of the evil one. Well, he's the only one that can. You've got to rely on him for that. Because, see, salvation is also deliverance. Oh, praise God, we have to rely on him for, for our salvation. We rely on him for our deliverance. But now, O oh Lord, thou art our father. And we are the clay, thou art the potter, and we all are the work of of thy hand. Whoa. Glory. So we're waiting. It's a time of growth. And in that growth, we have to trust, be patient, love, and build character, develop it. Then we find Jesus was sent in the power of God. He was sent to save us from our sin. He was sent to save us from our stinking, rotten, good works and our self-righteousness. And he was sent to, so that we could learn to rely on him and to depend on him for complete deliverance. All right, Jesus was sent also, quickly. I want to go through it here. We're just about finished now. I won't go long on these. All right, you with me? I'll try my best because I know you're hungry. But thank God we don't have to go out to eat. So we don't have to wait till we're finished and then ask everybody where they're going and who we're going to go and then call up and order pre-time and go and sit at the restaurant and wait for an hour. Oh, praise God, so that means I get to preach one more hour. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And when I'm done, that one's going to take over and give me about an hour rest and then I'm going to pick it up. And we're going to have tag team preaching tonight. And maybe we'll have an old-fashioned camp meeting. And then an old-fashioned revival. And heaven just might come down and fill our souls. Wow. And just think all the people who weren't here are going to miss out on it. That's why I don't ever want to miss church because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know when God's going to show up in strength and power and glory or whatever. But whatever it is, I want to be here. And I want to be in on it. I don't want to miss it. Wow, I'm telling you. Wouldn't that be something the Lord walked through the door just now? What if God was to send an angel in here to talk to us? I have a message from the Lord for this church. And this is the message. And gives it to us and he's gone. Most of us would faint, pass out. It could happen. Don't underestimate God's power and ability to do. He can do anything and everything. Whenever he wants, however he wants to do. And if he's going to do it, I know I want to be in on it. Just like if God's going to take this little church and this ministry and take it worldwide and take it throughout the, our state. Because you, you hang in here with Brother Claude, and I'm telling you, we're not just going to be in Central Florida. We're going to be in the whole state of Florida. And I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of what God's going to do to reach our state for the gospel of Jesus Christ. By vision. Praise the Lord. Hi, right, Jesus was sent. What was he sent for? He was sent to bring us answer to our needs. Anybody got any needs? You've been asking God to meet your needs? All right, your needs are met in Christ. So God sent Jesus because he promised he would, amen. He said, you're going to have to wait 700 years, but he's coming. And now he's coming, gone, and guess what? We still get the benefit of it. And so God, has, Jesus was sent to answer the needs of our life. The thief cometh but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life 
and they might have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. A life full of meaning and full of purpose. Jesus was sent to answer and to your prayers and to meet you. He's the answer to your need. Jesus was sent to be the answer to your need. If you got Jesus, that's all you need. We don't need nothing else. The Lord is my shepherd. David said, what more shall I want? But David put it this way, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I like to say, the Lord is my shepherd, what more do I want? Or the Lord is my shepherd, what, what, what more could I want? Amen? If you got Jesus, you got it. And God sent Jesus to be the answer to my needs. Hallelujah. Jesus was sent to bring relief to the struggles of this life. These things have I spoken unto you. All that in me ye might have peace. But in the world you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So you struggling tonight? Then God will give you relief from your struggles. Well, you don't know the trial I'm going through. You don't know the temptation I'm going through. No, but God does. And God says, guess what? You're going to have it, so don't think it's something strange or unusual. You're going to have it. But God says, hey, I'm going to free you up from that. I'm going to relieve you of your struggle. Ah, Jesus was sent to bring forgiveness, just as he promised. Listen to this wonderful, beautiful verse. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Doesn't get any better than that. Doesn't get any better than that. See, all this was having to do with waiting on the Lord for the Old Testament, and He came, just like God said. And God told us and promised us He's coming again. In the meantime, you got to wait. And in the waiting, you got to be patient. You got to trust. You got to love. You got to build some character. And Jesus was sent to demonstrate God's power, to rescue us from sin, to save us from our stinking good works, to cause us to rely on Him for our deliverance. He was sent that He would be the answer to my needs. He was sent to help me when times of trouble and tribulation hour, that I could be of good cheer because He's overcome. Jesus was sent to bring me total, complete forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And Jesus was sent to fulfill the promises as provided by Christ. What did he say? And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what? The promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me. What were they waiting in the upper room for the promise? The power of the Holy Ghost. Go and wait and you shall be endued with power from on high. And the results of it, you're going to be witnesses. Hallelujah. Real easy. Your coming adventure is to see the scent. Who's the scent? Jesus. And make a difference. How many of you see Jesus tonight? We need to make a difference, do we not? This is our adventure. This is our advent, if you please. This is our advent, church, is to make a difference. Are you making a difference tonight? Huh? We're to make a difference. What do we make a difference in? We're to make a difference in the lives of those in your world. The people that are involved in your world, around you, watch them. Watch what's going on. And make a difference in their life. See, that's your advent. That's your coming. See, Christ is coming. We don't have to worry about it. But we need to be doing something. We need to be making a difference in the ways of those who celebrate Christ's birth. A year ago, two years ago, we were concerned whether we were ever going to get to celebrate the birthday anymore. There was such a a, a push on no more Christmas, no more saying Merry Christmas, and no more nativities, no more everything. But you notice when President Trump got in office that first Christmas, or before he took the inauguration on, on January, but, then, but he won the election in November. And that Christmas, everybody was saying Merry Christmas. Everybody was putting up nativities. Everybody was praising God and, and, and so forth. See, and that's what we need to do as believers every year now while we have this opportunity. We, made to make, we need to make a difference in those that celebrate the birth of Christ. 
Tell them the truth. Tell them what it's about. Give them the purpose. Show them the reason. See, make a difference in their life. That's my advent. We need to make a difference in the hearts of those who are giving. Giving. Be supportive. Be encouraged in giving and the giving to others. Help them. Make a difference in their giving by setting an example. That's why you ought to put something in an offering plate every time it's passed. Thank you. Why? It's an example. It's a testimony. It's being an encouragement to somebody else. You're trying to make a difference in their lives in giving. You're trying to help them give to the Lord and to the Lord's work. Do you realize that just everybody, every service gave a dollar what we would have? Don't ever let the plate go by without throwing something in it. You know what I put in there tonight? I want to tell you what I put in this morning. That's my business. You know, I put it there tonight. I put my two McChicken dollars in there. I made a sacrifice. I sacrificed two McChickens tonight. Amen? Always. Our pastor in Alaska taught us that. Don't ever let the offering plate go by because people are watching you. People are looking at you. People are watching to see what you do. And there are guests, there are visitors, there's lost people. They don't understand. What's all this? This is the most craziest thing I've ever seen. People show up in this church. They start singing. Then some guy gets up and starts screaming at them. And they pay for doing it. That's what they think. Be a blessing. Be a testimony. We don't take it. I don't want it. God takes care of me. Be a blessing. That's my coming. That's my advent. Is to help someone with their heart that maybe are sitting there and they're just struggling with it. I don't know about this thing of giving. Because basically we're all selfish. Our flesh, we're selfish. We're stingy. We're selfish. You know the, you know, the hardest thing for, for in a Christian's life, the hardest thing to do is to get a hold of a believer's pocketbook. They're willing to give you everything else but their wallet. You can have my life, but you can't have my wallet. Help somebody else that may be struggling with that. Help them to, to, to get over that. I learned a long time ago that when we get young people saved, boys and girls, or even adults get saved, that if you cannot disciple them and teach them the gift and grace of giving within the first six weeks of their salvation, they will fight that for the rest of their life if they don't get a hold of it. Don't be stingy with what God's given you. Because it's all His. He gave it to you. You're just to be a good steward and manager of it. And God loves a cheerful giver. That's a hilarious giver. You guys ought to break out laughing hysterics and get side aches and fall on the floor and roll around and laugh so hard because you get a chance to give to God. Amen. All right, here's the last one. And in ways that you can touch lives of those people around you. Go make a difference. Go make a difference. Let your coming make a difference in the lives of people around you. You see, your adventure is to let your light shine. Let's read it and we're done and we'll go eat. The people which sat in darkness, that's interesting what we talked about this morning, saw a great light and to them which sat in the region and in shadow of death, light is sprung up. That was Christ. The Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, this is all in his Sermon on the Mount. Ye are the light of the world. 
A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Didn't we sing that on our spiritual trailer ride? How many of you were on the spiritual hayride Friday night? Come on, let me see your hands. All of you on the spiritual hayride that were with us on the spiritual hayride Friday night. Nah, we know who you are. Don't raise your hand. We know who you are. What did we sing? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I won't let Satan blow it out, right? We did that, amen. We won't hide it under a bush, no, no, no. We went on. Oh, you see, what are we going to do? Let our light shine, and boy, it can shine out there because it was dark out there. But the stars were out, and we were picking them out. There's the Big Dipper, and Oh, there's the Little Dipper, and hey, there's your Ryan's belt, you know. And then I got out my phone, and I have a military navigation system, and it pops up, and it shows us where we're at in the stars, and we can navigate. I mean, the stars are so bright. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. So... The coming of the Lord, it's a time of waiting. And it's a time of spiritual growth. And then it's a time for making a difference in the lives of people. All right, church? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now let's pray, and we'll ask God to bless the food, and then we'll go have a wonderful time of fellowship and eating. And it's a smorgasbord, and it's all you can eat. Amen. Our Father, thank you. For this little lesson we've learned from the Holy Spirit, from the book of Isaiah, written 700 years before the coming of the Lord. What a little nice little lesson we learned in this about waiting for the coming of the Lord. Things we can learn, things we can do, things we can apply in our lives. Father, help us not to forget it now, and help us not to be hearers only, but to be doers of your word. To make a difference in the lives of people in all walks of life, all areas and ways of life, culture of life, we can make a difference. And Father, help us to let our light shine so that they will see our good works and glorify you, which is in heaven. Father, we bless you. We thank you. Lord, again, be with our folks that are down. Jerry and Liz are not feeling good tonight as well. Father, bless them. Be with them. John and Sharon. Sister Carol, Lord, just bless them, raise them up, restore their health. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. And now, Lord, thank you for the food. And we ask you would bless it to our bodies and our bodies to your service now. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go eat and enjoy a wonderful meal.